So can you all see my screen? Yeah, you can give it a go. All right. So um, thank you very much for the organizers putting together <clears throat> very interesting program. And so um, today I'm going to talk about um, statistical perspective. So I'm uh, in the Department of uh, Statistics, and uh, I'll talk about the statistical perspective on understanding generalization and uh, test error. And so this is joint work with uh, Li Song Lin, who is a really exceptionally talented uh, starting PhD student at uh, Berkeley. Uh, all right. So I uh, looks like I shared the wrong slide. I apologize. I have a longer version of the talk uh, that I gave uh, earlier. I need to share the short version of the slide. I apologize. There's a subfolder. Now we need, you know, like the music that you get when you're waiting at the. <laughs> I hope, yeah, no, it's a... I got the music that you get from from the NRS. Rookie mistake, but uh, yeah. all right. So there we go. So let's um, start with the bias variance decomposition, which is one of the most uh, kind of basic, but also one of the most useful kind of an important concept in statistics, machine learning, and the data science. So here, um, what we are trying to solve is we're trying to solve a prediction problem. Um, so we train some model based on some training data. Let's call it F hat. And then we want to predict uh, label Y by applying F hat on some new uh, test data. Point. And so uh, we can decompose this um, squared prediction error into the value of the just intrinsic noise in Y um, plus the uh, deviation between the mean of Y and the mean of your uh, mean of our uh, prediction uh, by F hat, which is the squared bias. And then also the deviation of f hat from its mean, which is the variance. So this is really fundamental. It's kind of it's universal. It's universally applicable to all kind of prediction problems, and even you know estimation problems. Um, and so uh, usually, what we think about is we want to kind of strike the right balance, as it's shown in this picture, where we want to find a model that's kind of not too large, so that it doesn't have too much uh, variance, but kind of large enough that it has small bias. And Neural networks, uh, partly the interest in them is because somehow they have uh, experimentally a very good trade off in bias and um, uh, in, in the bias and variance. And there's been a lot of work in the direction of double descent and so on. I'll talk about it a little later. But our perspective is, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, perspective that we're trying to uh, uh, do. So we are uh, interested in attributing the sources of the variance to the various components that actually are changing. So um, if I train a, train a model, then for instance, if I train a neural net, I have a different random initialization for, my, uh, for every different uh, neural net that I train, right? And uh, when I have uh, new data that comes in in my training, then I also have uh, variability due to the, these input features, and I also have label noise. So all of these components contribute to f hat, so they contribute to the variability. And it also uh, there are other components like the randomness in the optimization algorithm. Suppose I use some standard stochastic optimization, for instance, I choose the mini batches randomly. I, uh, those choices uh, affect the randomness in effect. So they affect the variance. And our approach is, so our my kind of question is, how can we um, basically in a principled way make attributions of these different kind of components to the, uh, to the variability um, in, a, in a kind of uh, unequivocal way? And so it, it turns out there is a, a uh, classical idea in statistics called uh, ANOVA, the analysis of variance, which I'll explain. It's a kind of at least 100 years old idea. And that's what we propose uh, to use uh, here. So I'll explain how, um, how that goes next. Um, but in order, um, so we don't just kind of propose this as very, uh, at a very high level, we also work out 
uh, kind of um, examples of uh, some random features models uh, to actually calculate these variance components. To explain that, I'd like to give you the more concrete setting here. So in the setting, we have n data points, standard uh, features xi and outcome yi. And we assume that the true model that generates the data is actually linear. And so uh, we have a label noise epsilon. So this can be put in a matrix form, y equals x theta plus epsilon. And uh, in order to simplify the analysis and get some kind of analytically tractable results, we make a lot of uh, assumptions here. So we assume that the, uh, the, this distribution of uh, the vector x has uh, IID entries. Um, the noise is normal with uh, some uh, common variance sigma squared. And we also assume that the parameter theta is random, um, the kind of uh, normalized so that it has uh, expect norm uh, alpha squares. Alpha square is kind of the signal strength. And it uh, turns out that the randomness in theta in principle, could also affect the variance, but it will uh, it will have a vanishing effect. So it will kind of uh, we will we will not need to include that in the variance components. And then we will fit a very simple uh, linear random features model. Um, I will not have time to talk about the two uh, the the nonlinear uh, random features model that we fit. But in the linear case, very simple W X transpose beta. This is the model and the weight the weight matrix. Uh, w is a uh, uniformly orthogonal uh, matrix. So, uh, so it's a uniformly orthogonal random matrix. I should say. And so, uh, this is these are the these are the this is the data model. This is the kind of uh, prediction model. And how do we train it? We just train it uh, in a in with something that's analytically kind of uh, tractable. Which is an L2 loss, so mean squared error, plus a ridge regularization parameter. And then we effectively get an explicit predictor that has this form. It's just a ridge regression of Y on um, X times W transpose. So um, it's kind of all very explicit here. And uh, in red, you can see the sources that I'm going to study. So when I train this F hat, this could be. Uh, maybe it should be f hat here. So it depends on x. Of course, my predictor depends on the training data. The f hat also depends on the epsilon, right? It implicitly depends on the epsilon because it depends on uh, through through y, right? And the f hat also depends on what initialization I chose here. So it depends on all three of these randomly chosen components. And then we want to understand this dependence. We want to decompose the dependence and variability variance um, that is kept that is uh, in F into these three components. So uh, just uh, repeating, uh, this is the uh, this is the bias uh, variance decomposition. And um, as I said, we would like to understand what are the contributions. So a key um, kind of inspiration for us was uh, this nice work from um, um, uh, uh, Daskoli and the collaborators last year that um, looked at a very similar model with a uh, few, few technical uh, differences, but very similar model. And they decomposed the variance in the following order. So first take conditional expectation over X and W, W and X and then take conditional expectation over x. So this is the kind of specifically chosen order. And by the tower property of uh, conditional expectation, you can you know, write this, this sum in this way. So uh, this is one of the things that really got us thinking of whether, you know, what is the, what is the meaning of these terms? What is the interpretation? And whether there is some, uh, something canonical, more canonical to do here. And so, uh, as uh, you know, this is the statistical idea of the ANOVA that uh, turns out is kind of an answer for this. So here, uh, I'll explain what the ANOVA is. So let's start. Let's give uh, these quantities some uh, short, uh, even more shorthand names. So X are the samples. So I'll call it S. W is the initialization. So I'll call it I. And epsilon is the label noise, or you know, the outcome noise. So I'll call it L. So it's S I L. And so this variance can be written as a sum of these seven terms, VS, VLDI, 
SL, SI, LI, pairwise interactions, and the triple. And they are defined the following way. So um, I take F hat, and for every index A that's in this uh, you know, set, I compute the conditional expectation of F hat conditional on that quantity, let's say conditional X, W, or epsilon. And so that is now a quantity that only depends on that A, whatever that A is, right? And so I can take its variance. So that is called the VA, the, um, that is called the marginal effect or main effect of varying A alone. So it says, you know, on average, if I just change A, what is the variance of, what is the um, effect of varying A just by itself marginally on F hat? Then there are the interaction terms, which are defined very similarly, where you take the conditional expectation with respect to A and B, and then you subtract the marginal, uh, marginal effect. Turns out these are all non-negative. Very similarly, you uh, define the three-way interaction as well. So VAB is called the second order interaction effect between A and B, and ABC is the third order interaction effect. So of course, this is defined for any kind of uh, number of uh, you know, uh, any number, not just three, and it's uh, defined very generally for any random variables. Uh, we, um, and it's a kind of, you know, really well-developed classical tool in statistics. So we applied it here for a particular kind of uh, machine learning uh, problem. And so uh, to give you the results, we looked at uh, asymptotic regime, which has been kind of present in a few uh, talks in this, uh, in this uh, conference. So letting uh, the dimension d grow to infinity, letting the um, number of parameters p go to infinity uh, proportionally. So p by d is a sort of parameterization level, how many parameters uh, do, uh, uh, do I have? So PP is the number of uh, random features in the intermediary, intermediate layer. And then letting uh, D by N uh, also tend to uh, a constant, D is the data dimension. And uh, there's a, some quantities that we need to express our result. Gamma is just pi times delta. And then theta J's are the so-called resolvent moments. So this is, um, um, so we have this kind of famous distribution, the Marchenko Pastor distribution with parameter uh, uh, aspect ratio gamma, and then theta j are just the expectations of one over x plus lambda two power j, uh, and we need only j equals one and two. So these are just some uh, functions that we, uh, there are actually explicit formulas for them, for uh, actually j equals one is just the still test transform, you know, doesn't matter. And, um, then, so these are, these are some things that we need just to state the result, which you'll see in the next slide. And there's also something uh, kind of conceptual. There's this lambda, uh, the regularization parameter, and there's an effective regularization parameter, lambda tilde, that's slightly larger due to additional kind of randomness that uh, is induced by the random uh, uh, feature projection step. So it's a slightly higher regularization uh, parameter. So, there is one result which takes up a whole slide to state uh, that uh, we find the in this in this model the linear random features model under this asymptotic that I stated we find the limits almost sure limits as uh, the dimension samples and uh, number of random features diverges to infinity of uh, the each of the seven components. So the variance component, the main effect of varying the samples, features X, the label, the initialization, and so on. And you know, of course, I can't, you know, it's 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 a these are closed form expressions, so we know everything here, but you know, it's not really possible to remember these. Instead, we will plot them and we will analyze them uh, in terms of their monotonicity and unimodality and so on. Something interesting is that two of the terms are zero. So what does that mean? That the um, main effect of L, uh, VL uh, is, is uh, tends to zero. So that means that the label noise only affects the variance, this particular model, due to its interaction effects with the sample and uh, the three of them also interact together. So um, I'll explain what I, um, you know, what, what is the implications or why I think uh, such a result is, you know, uh, kind of meaningful or uh, important. 
first, like, if you look at some plots, here's a plot that uh, shows the bias uh, and uh, these, these non-zero components in a kind of particular choice of, uh, particular choice of signal strength, reasonable signal strength, noise level, reg fixed regularization parameter as a function of the data kind of, uh, um, uh, so as a function of D by N, as a function of the dimension effectively, if you wish. So what you can see, um, there's a large, there's this large literature on random, uh, well, uh, on, on double descent, and I'll have some uh, references uh, later on. You see an increase in the overall mean squared error and then a sort of decrease. But more interestingly, you see that in the variance component, so um, uh, not, the, not the blue, everything else, in the, in the variance components, the largest term is this interaction effect. So the reason why that's kind of interesting and subtle is that if you want to say something like, oh, you know, the label noise is the one that causes the, you know, the biggest, it's the biggest component of the variance. Such a claim is, you know, very hard to, uh, hard to make because it's just the interaction. The interaction term is the one that's kind of large. So you cannot uh, put the, put the, uh, it's not just that the, you know, these marginal effects are large, but it's in the interaction terms. So I think to me, at least that's something that's, uh, that was quite, uh, quite surprising and uh, still, you know, I'm uh, puzzled by it every time that I think about it. And so another thing, we can uh, make a lot of plots. We can show, we can display how these uh, various components behave as a function of the parameterization level, uh, you know, the number of uh, inner, uh, uh, inner uh, neurons and as a function of the data dimension, and you know, you, this is how they look. You, what is maybe interesting to see here, you can see this kind of uh, heat, these are heat maps. So uh, um, the yellow is kind of the high value. So you can see here that they're large along this curve. This is the interpolation threshold where roughly speaking, there's some matrix that has a, a poor condition number. Then you can compare it to what happens if you do optimal regulation, so I should say, this was for some fixed regularization parameter, and you can compare it what you, with the optimal regularization parameter, and things kind of change. The, 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 the heat maps look much different. And in fact, if you look more carefully, you will see that this interaction effect between the samples and the initialization is one that's decreased by a huge amount. So actually, the scale here is not the same. I you know, apologize for that. Here, this is something like 3.6 and here this is 0 0.006, so it's like 50 times smaller. So if you regularize optimally, um, this is what changes this interaction effect. That's the one that changes the most. Okay. So um, um, so. In addition, what I'd like to mention is that the order in which we do the decomposition has a large effect. So um, remember that you know our one of our inspirations was the nice work from uh, uh, Dascoli and collaborators. But if we look at two different orders here that are in just two random randomly chosen orders, sample label initialization and label initialization and sample, what you can see is that um, these um, so in in the in this in this a, in the ABC order uh, C is just the marginal effect B is the sum of the uh, two effects um, that that uh, that include uh, that include um, B and uh, A ABC is the sum of all the well. Uh, all the terms that include A. Then what you can see is that, for instance, if I look at the value of um, maybe sigma S here, sigma S is really large, but sigma S here in the different order is small. So anyway, just to kind of uh, hammer down, hammer back, hammer down the point that 
uh, if I want to say, oh, the S, the data points are the ones that cause large variance, that it depends on the order if you don't look at uh, the kind of each of the terms separately. And we have um, provided a number of results on monotonicity and unimodality. How many minutes do I have? Mm, very little again. We're very little, okay. Drifting, so, we're drifting, uh, drifting later. Yeah. later. So in the interest of time, let me skip the monotonicity and animality. They are very interesting. Uh, we show uh, what I want to say is the with optimal, without optimal regularization and with optimal regularization, the monotonicity and animality behavior is really uh, different. There's a number of nice works that kind of inspired us, including by Pritum, Nakiran, and collaborators. He also spoke earlier. And uh, we've done a quite thorough study uh, of this phenomenon in our paper. A lot of related works here. Um, and uh, there are several talks at this workshop that considered related random features models by uh, Refinetti, Mishikiewicz, uh, Bengningi, and uh, Gervelo. So I hope somewhat correct pronunciation. And I want to mention the most close related work, especially the one by Ben Adlam and Jeffrey Pennington, which was a parallel work to ours that kind of independently also derived ANOVA in a slightly different model. There's a neat uh, Twitter uh, post here that says, shows how 100 year old system models can provide useful frameworks to study modern machine learning. So that's kind of uh, our, uh, our contribution. In terms of the proofs, we use some deterministic equivalents from random matrix theory. So that's just uh, one, one uh, line about the proofs. All right, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs>